successful. But it is difficult for us to understand why it's not happening. And we're going to explore that a bit today. So I'll remind everybody that the state of affairs when it comes to using data in corporate settings, there are lots of problems that people are facing. We hear that data projects are failing to deliver the value that uh, we want them to deliver. We are seeing that companies are not becoming as data-driven as they could be. We see statistics like this, where data science projects don't often make it into production. So when sci data scientists are working on projects for months and months, sometimes they don't end up becoming a part of the business. And then we see even that the basics like dashboards, for the most part, don't get used and adopted. So it's not that everything is swimmingly successful. We have a real problem. And more recently, we're seeing that those same types of statistics exist in the new areas of AI. So they conclude that despite aspirational headlines and tantalizing potential, most AI projects are still failing. And they're estimating that only one in five actually makes it into production being used by the company to produce value. So we know that data are critical. We know that we have to use data. And there was an amazing report that I really enjoyed reading from Oracle that came out at the end of 2023 called The Decision Dilemma. And they looked at it in a particular way. So they interviewed and surveyed 14,000 people globally and found that, as you would expect, 97% of leaders want to use data for better decisions. They believe that better decisions are going to reduce risk, that better decisions from data will help them be more decisive and make decisions faster. They believe that data will help them make more money and plan for the unexpected. And not surprisingly, 93% of leaders agreed that the right type of business intelligence can make or break their success. So when we look at it to begin with, this all looks like great. We love hearing, <clears throat> we love knowing that data can help drive the business forward. However, in reality, those same leaders admit that data has become overwhelming. 73% say that because they lacked trust in the data from their own organization, they just didn't make any decision at all, which that one kind of stunned me. The 89% believe that the number of data sources, the volume of information actually has limited the success of their organization. And 86% said the amount of data that gets thrown at them all the time is making their professional lives more complicated. And they even said that it's also making their personal lives more complicated. So while they agree that data will help them lead their companies to a successful outcome, they really are having trouble digesting it all. And probably even more alarming is that data gets discounted also. Look at these facts. From this survey, 78% of leaders said they actually believe that most decisions are already made ahead of time. And then they're just using data to justify what they already decided. 
Another one, 74% of employees, so the people working for those leaders, believe that the opinions of the top paid executives are valued more than what the data might say. So you can imagine how willing somebody is to go in with information that contradicts what that executive thinks. And lastly, 70% of leaders actually said, I just wish something automated would make the decision for me, whether that be an algorithm or a robot or something else. So we are in a very weird position. We know data will be critical, but we're overwhelmed by it. And sometimes we just would rather not deal with it. And we wanna do it the old way. So if we look at how other surveys are looking at organizations, this was uh, looking at the structure and processes within an organization. And they took a look at a whole variety of companies and came to the conclusion that a third were still at the bottom level of data aware, which the way that they described it was companies that know that data are available, but they really aren't systematically used and applied to make decisions. That about a quarter are data proficient and proficiency meant that they, they really knew how to understand that information, but there wasn't anything structurally put in place to make sure that data was always included. Data savvy is getting closer. They do use it. They're starting to apply it in, in many instances, but only 16% were considered data driven where they defined it as that data is utilized as a critical asset for both business strategy and operations. So again, we're looking at fewer than one in five companies are able to leverage the asset of data in ways that give them an advantage. And it just always makes me wonder, what do we need to do to make sure that we're leveraging data to a company's advantage? How do we get there? How do we elevate ourselves to a place where we're making the use of data that we should? And so I'm gonna talk about several different options and why I think they might or might not work. I read a lot about what futurists think, um, what's gonna happen when it comes to using data, given the volume, given the resistance that people have. And one of the things that comes up a lot is AI enabled data intelligence. And there was a great article in Forrester called Bringing Data Insights to the Other 80% of Business Intelligent User, Intelligence Users. And according to this article, the ceiling of people using self-serve business intelligence tools is really about 20%. They said only one in five leaders and executives make use of it. So we're just not gonna see the uptake because they aren't gonna use the tools or the dashboard. They might assign somebody else to tell them about it, but it just isn't gonna happen. The next part though was surprising to me. They said that despite natural language queries being sort of the next frontier and starting to take hold, they believe that that was only another 10% of use maximum. And their point was, is even if you can say it in natural language, you still have to know so many things about how to ask and what to ask for and in what ways in order for the SQL behind the, the scenes or some other tool behind the scenes to go select it and present it in the way that they want. So we're still at less than a third uh, penetration of using data. The next level that they described was they thought that machine learning driven alerts were going to be um, available soon. 
So machine learning could be used to identify when something is necessary to identify um, what might catch the attention of uh, executives. And so that it would just tell them when they need to know something. And that would give us, get us up to about 50%. They thought about 20% of executives would, would learn this. And then the most futuristic part was they believed that we would eventually get to 100% use of data for business intelligence using what they call ambient business intelligence. So behind the scenes, machines will be so smart and AI will learn what it is that is concerning an executive in such a way that it will just provide it, give it to an executive at the moment that they need it. And so they described something that sounds pretty amazing. The post dashboard world of business intelligence will be impactful, actionable, augmented, unified, personalized, adaptive and pervasive. So it essentially will be all around you doing it for you. Now it sounds wonderful. I hope that it's true, but I do have my concerns and doubts about how soon that will happen. And then I do have one other question about that, which is if executives admit now that they have such a doubt in the quality of data and they don't trust the data now, even when it's something that they went and asked for, when they haven't trusted data enough to even make a decision of any kind, then Will they be able to trust data when it's just being served up to them behind the scenes? And I don't know the answer to that. Maybe people will trust that more, but it does make me wonder if people who are not aware of how the data are structured or how reliable they are, whether they will believe it. So I love these, this idea. I would hope that it happens 10, 15 years. Maybe you guys think it'll be sooner. I don't know, but I do wonder. So let's move to the second category. So in this category <clears throat> is what our whole series is about. Widespread data literacy adoption. We hear about this all the time. And I hear it mostly from data professionals. We need everyone else to become literate so that they know what they're asking for. They know what's biased, what's true. They know how to use it. And we can understand this partly because we see statistics like this in the last year that chief information officers are saying that most of the reason that big data and AI haven't fully been adopted into a data-driven strategy is because of people and culture. It's not technology. So we hear over and over again, it's the people, it's the people. And if we're on the data side, we like to say it's the business people. So what does literacy look like? We've talked about it before and there's many definitions, but let's call this the literacy tower. And the definition is similar or a lot like what I will present. Let's say that first of all, we want people to be at least aware of what data are available. We want them to select the right types of metrics to answer the question that they need. We want them to understand what they're seeing. We also want them to begin to manipulate data, at least with the basics. And then I see calls to have everybody be data literate enough that they can actually analyze data, that they can interpret analysis, and then apply it reliably and accurately to make decisions. So if we can achieve that, 
everyone says, gosh, we need all these business people to now become literacy men. We are the person who is at the pinnacle that understands it. And it would make life so much easier. And the conventional wisdom that I hear from data folks is that we just need to get more people to the top of the tower. That is what we have to do. So when I think about this and I think about how do we get people to the top? How do we help them climb up this? How do we provide just the right type of information so that they can get there and make it there? And so I look a lot at the various types of data literacy or training. And if we're thinking about trying to get people to the top, we're not talking about just basic awareness. We're talking about get them, getting them up to an analyst level or a data science level. So what I would like you guys all to do, and I'll ask Mark to um, keep an eye on the chat if you feel like uh, putting in your estimate. But let's talk about how long it takes for a person who isn't familiar with data to achieve these different levels of literacy. So if we say that awareness is knowing what kinds of data are available in your organization, the limitations of those data, the characteristics of those data, what their format is, what the frequency of getting the data might be, what the definitions are, how long do we think that will take to train somebody? And Mark, if you feel like jumping in any of these, let me know what you hear from people. But I, I know in my time, Wendy, that's always taken um, uh, a, a, a bit of time to get people kind of cooking there, but we do have uh, an answer in chat. We've got a bunch of answers in chat now. Uh, somebody says a full-time job, one year, uh, two years, <laughs> one year, two years, six months, okay. uh, depends on the folks, depends on the commitment, three years, one to two years. Uh, All right. yeah, lots okay. of, lots of various, uh, answers there. All right. So it may take a while. So then let's go to the next level, knowing how to select the right metric, ask for it appropriately and know what other related metrics that you need to be aware of. Maybe it's different groups or different timelines or different um, aspects of the data. How long would it take to teach somebody that? Is this one shorter or longer? <laughs> After awareness, another six months, six months, um, six months. we got one longer, longer, shorter, uh, depends on the structure and okay. format. All months, right. Six months. We're kind of hovering around six months. Okay. Um, All perpetual right. and ongoing. I like that answer. Um, yes. Yeah. All right. So we're at about 18 months to get to this level. Now we're just going to try and understand it. So that would be knowing what you're looking at, knowing whether it's, um, uh, it's, usual or unusual, knowing whether it's typical or an outlier, having basic descriptives, knowing how people differ along that. How long will that take to get people to do that? We got three months, another six months, three months, two to three months. Um, <laughs> I, I like this. Also consider if they're interested <laughs> or if they don't <laughs> think data is part of their job. I love that. All right. But <laughs> Doggone it, we're getting people to the top. All right, so we're three way up there. So manipulate, helping people learn how to sort and clean and order and join and segment and integrate data. If we're really <laughs> wanting people to be data manipulators, what's that gonna take? Yeah, it chat's a little less uh, optimistic on this one. <laughs> Years, <laughs> lifetime, six months Forever. to a year, a year. Forever. <laughs> Wouldn't yes. say this is taught on the job. <laughs> Three years. <laughs> yeah. Okay, it's going to be years. Okay, analyze. So actually do the analysis. So running descriptives, doing comparisons, basic statistical understanding, maybe it starting at doing some models what what how long is that going to take 
for a four year degree. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Infinity. <laughs> Infinity. <laughs> yeah. Yes. It takes. Did it, did we ever get it in the first semester anyway? So yes. <laughs> so. And so then interpreting. So understanding what you're seeing, the implications of what you're seeing, the significance, accuracy, bias, what weights actually mean, how to know what it is that the, the implications are for what you just analyzed. What about that? I, I, I love one thing in chat that uh, somebody just posted. It's like, you're now talking about a qualified professional that understands statistics. <laughs> understood. understood. Yes. Yes. And, you know, we can decide that we, we literacy is only the first three at the bottom, or we can decide that literacy is, goes up to manipulation, or we can decide it goes to a certain level. But what we're seeing from all of your opinions is this is not something basic if we want people to do it well. And so then we have the application, which means converting those results into clear evidence that helps you know how to make a decision and what decision to make. So from what we're hearing is we all understand that doing these things well takes a long time. And yet there is this push to make sure that business people become more literate because it's making data people's life hard when they're not. So I just went online to see what they would say if I said, how long does it take to become literate or become a data scientist? Because to me, some of those things that are in there is a data science kind of a qualification. And MIT says they can make you a data scientist in 12 weeks. But then you read the fine print and they say, well, you know, uh, it may take you a little bit longer than that 12 weeks. Then I went to this other site that said, you can become a data scientist with no experience whatsoever and we can get you there in just a few months. But then you scroll down and they say, but yeah, you need to probably brush up on the math skills you already have. <laughs> so I was thinking about some of my business colleagues and whether they really ever had linear algebra or Bayesian modeling or any of these other aspects of calculus and statistics. So there is a lot of noise about being able to become agile and capable in data analysis very quickly. And depending on where you look, they say you can do all of this. A person with no coding experience or mathematical background can become a data scientist in seven to 12 months if you really want to. So that was one of the comments that you mentioned, Mark, is that you have to really be interested. But when we all know it, we know to do it well, it takes some time. In addition, I've seen many articles saying, do we really want to have people who don't know what they're doing making decisions with data? So the flip side is we want everybody to be data literate, but do we really want people who aren't that literate to be involving themselves? And so there's articles here, Harvard Business Review, about the risks of empowering people to use data who don't really know what they're doing. So there is that downside. On top of that, it always strikes me as interesting that we want people to become data literate when the people who are extremely literate, the people who actually teach literacy, data scientists aren't that successful in business in many, many cases. So in 2022, I think, they declared that data science was the sexiest job 
I don't remember who it was, but somebody did, probably Gardner or somebody. And so then this February, an article came out saying data science is still the sexiest job, but nobody will listen to you. So only one in five machine learning models gets deployed because there is some kind of a communication gap. Also, we have results like this survey that I administered on LinkedIn that the analytic team, and these are data scientists and advanced data analysts who I surveyed, don't get the kinds of requests that they need to do their work. So these are very, very literate people in terms to data, but when they get a request, two thirds of the time, it's either frustrating or it doesn't have enough context to get done what they need to do. Another survey, when you get a request, again, this is asking very literate, very talented data analysts and data scientists, are you able to provide the right answer the first time with no rework? 68% said less than half the time that they can do that. With the one comment that you see on the right, I answered most of the time because technically I did give them what they asked for, even though it wasn't what they wanted. So again, we're asking people who aren't data oriented to become data literate so that they can do as well as data scientists who aren't able to provide what the business wants. And the business says, these data scientists and analysts don't give me things in a way that I can understand two thirds of the time. They don't get what they need. Only 7% said, I always get what I need and my relationship with the data people is awesome. So here we are saying, we gotta, we gotta get everybody to be literate. But number one, it's really hard to get people literate. And number two, even the ones who are, aren't doing as well as we would like. So once again, widespread data literacy adoption, how much do we want them to study? How long will it take? And if trained data experts are having this much trouble, should that really be our goal? So option number three, two-way literacy. So this is looking at not only having data literacy for business people, but what about business literacy for data people? This was a very interesting article in the Harvard Data Science Review, it came out in 2020. But this author, um, drew a parallel between the communication between teams and being a good writer. And she pointed out that every time a data science scientist hands off a report with the outcome being described in terms of a quantitative metric with no clear translation to a business outcome, then she is a lazy writer asking her reader, the business stakeholder to do too much work. But then she also said, every time a business stakeholder asks for business value from a data scientist without doing all the work that's required quantifiably, what that means, then he is a lady, lazy writer asking the reader, the data scientist to clean up his disorganization. And her conclusion was, success will only come from both sides caring enough working hard enough to express their quantitative goals and results using metrics that the other side understands. So this is essentially a call for both sides to get better at what the other side does. So if we're thinking about the data-driven group on the left and the business-driven group on the right, 
we see and we understand that they're driven by different things. One wants to achieve goals that are related to the business and to maximize business value. On the other side, you have people trained where their main goal, if they are trying to get to the pinnacle, is to find the truth from the data, to find it accurately with integrity and to innovate and find ways to extract more intelligence from the data. That doesn't mean that they're misaligned, but it does mean that sometimes they're focusing on different things. And so being at the pinnacle, the super data man on the left and the super business lady on the right are sometimes in conflict because they're focused on different things. So let's look at the literacy tower for business. The business goals mean that a person has to understand what the business needs to accomplish, to understand what the customer is trying to achieve, understand value creation, like what constitutes value to the organization, to understand the finances underneath and behind everything that gets done, whether it's the expenditures or whether it's the revenues, to understand the product pathway, to understand the future of the business and anticipate what's going on, and to know what investors, shareholders, owners really are trying to accomplish. So that is also a tall order. But the conventional wisdom on the business side is why can't we get these data people to understand what's really important rather than giving me these detailed reports that I don't understand. But we can think about this again, and I won't have you relate these back necessarily, but I want you to think how long will it take for data people to understand all the competing business priorities in the organization? How long will it take for them to understand the customer landscape, what the range of concerns they have are, what are the priorities of their concerns? What is their buying behavior and how is that segmented? Understand the supply chain and potential weaknesses in product delivery. What can go wrong? What can go right? How is that implemented with a sales cycle. To know financial performance, what are the margins on different products? What are the ways that we become more profitable or less profitable? How do we prioritize the product portfolio and contribute to product design? How do we look at the future in terms of earnings and liabilities so that we can really understand what the business is trying to achieve? And how do we become familiar with the way that owners, shareholders, investors wanna communicate and what their concerns are? Are we doing our analytic work in ways that pay attention to financial performance, that pay attention to product design, future liability, and what the shareholders are looking for. Are we adopting that mindset? And what would it take to train every data person to become this literate in the business? So when I think about this, I also wonder, like, can we train both sides well enough to bridge this gap? Can we take a data person, have them trained in all of the business levels of literacy enough so that they can understand all of those components and then go back 
and be a completely business literate data professional. On the flip side, can we train our business people to do all of the things necessary to be data literate, understanding, analyzing, and manipulating, applying, interpreting, so that they can go back to their business job and be a data literate business professional. These are not easy things to do. So like the other solutions, I love it. I love the idea of everyone being good at everything. I love the idea of AI taking over and doing all the work for us. But is this feasible is the question. And when I think about two-way literacy, again, I think it's a wonderful idea, but I just have to think of my most resistant business executive who's already overburdened. And I think about whether he or she would be willing <laughs> to go through data training. If I take my most accomplished individual performer who understands AI and machine learning and tell them they need to go to boot camp to understand uh, the financial tension in the organization. Just think about your most resistant person and will they be able to do this? Will they be interested like our person in chat said? And so let's look at our last solution of the day. And if you've heard me before, it won't surprise you. What about we bridge these two towers with a designated person who translates? So we have our super data people, we have our super business people, but what if we can create a bridge that makes the best of both with a goal that they have of mutual success and let the data-driven people be data-focused, let the business people be business-focused, and then create something in the middle that combines the best of both sides. So if we did that, what are the areas where we would help them bridge? The first one that I think of is knowledge. You can have people who happen to be very interested in both sides and they can manipulate, analyze, interpret and apply data with awareness and talent, but they also are very much aware of financial metrics, product pathways, business projections, and how to understand what's going on at the top where the shareholders, investors are. So they bridge that knowledge so that when somebody is analyzing data, they can point out that it isn't following the financial or shareholder priorities. Or when somebody is talking about business projections, they can reference and apply analysis that's already been done. The second thing that the bridge can do is really support the values of each side. So you would value the accuracy, accuracy, integrity, and innovation of really well done data manipulation, analysis, interpretation in ways that respect what is of maximum business value. And also help those who are working in the data side understand what is happening in the business that makes one or another methodology a lot more effective. 
But if you're not trying to see both, it's very hard to make sure that the other side appreciates what you're doing. Which leads me to the third one. Oh, and people start to value, data people start to value business objectives and business people start to value the data people's objectives. Third is communication. Knowing how to take what they know about data terminology to explain and interpret business priorities, to translate requirements in ways that make sense, and also interpret the context of why requests are being made, which is so often a sticking point because either the person on the business side doesn't know how to ask it, or they haven't provided the context of where that request is coming from. On the business side, the person understands the business terminology. They can explain complex analytics and data in terms of that um, business language. Translate what mixed findings actually mean, not based on the actual numbers, but what the implications are. And then provide a context for why results may have come out the way that they did and what the pros and cons are. And then lastly, one of the key roles of somebody who is a translator who builds this bridge is to build allegiance between the teams. Because if they don't start to appreciate each other, there becomes more and more tension and there is often real animosity between these groups. I've seen it over and over and over again because they don't understand each other. So we start on both sides with empathy and understanding, helping them build a connection, acknowledging that there is frustration and what that is about, and then demonstrate appreciation of the data side and also showing appreciation for the business side. And it's exactly the same mirror on the business side. Empathy and understanding for what they are facing, building connection with what the data side can do, acknowledging frustrations that they can't get exactly what they want sometimes because the data don't exist or because it's they don't have enough data or the data is too old or whatever. So understanding that that is frustrating and helping find solutions for that. And then again, demonstrating appreciation rather than blaming the other side. So the way that I see this is literacy is great. And for people who want to understand a different area, it's great. Having AI help answer a lot of our questions, wonderful. But in the short run, it's gonna take so much time if we're asking a big chunk of people to get literate on something else. Whereas the bridge can be done pretty quickly. So I would say that the bridge and having translators is an option that's absolutely worth considering and not one that has become yet uh, a standard option. So if we think about this way of developing mutual success, then we can, I think, maximize the best of both. So I will stop there and look for questions just to let you know Become an Analytic Translator is now a course available on Dataversity. And uh, we are soon gonna have communication for data professionals. But if you're wanting to be somebody who's the bridge and you it appeals to you to like both sides, um, then I would welcome having you take our course. So I will stop there. Yeah, and chat has been 
absolutely electric. Uh, pages and pages of chat, and um, uh, I've lost all the the questions and and um, uh, and commentary because it's it's so voluminous today. So thank you everybody for engaging in chat. But uh, that said, there there are no direct questions in the Q and A, so feel free to uh, get those in. But we do have a question that just popped into chat. Uh, how do we get signed up for the translator class? And that's, uh, I just put the URL in there. It's training.dataversity.net. Um, and you can find the translator class uh, there right away. Um, and we do have a question just popped in. Do you ever think that there will be a need for no translators? It's an interesting phrasing. That is. Um, I do believe that translators will always be useful. And whether that's to help train AI, because it gets to the point where AI gets really good at it. Um, so I suppose when we have that embedded, that imagined embedded AI um, business intelligence that is ubiquitous and invisible, perhaps uh, AI can get smart enough to, to actually play that role. Um, but I don't know if it'll get, it'll be that soon because I find that so much of this is a human thing. So it may prove me wrong, but right now we have a lot of fixing to do when it comes to the relationship between the business side and the uh, data side. There's just a lot of animosity. Uh, we do have an interesting question in chat. How does this fit with blue collar workers? And and my personal interpretation of that would be like reality on the ground. Yeah, it depends on. Um, so if any of you have ever gone through um, black belt training um, in quality assurance, some of those um, areas they ask, they do ask um, people who are, you know, as you say, on the ground, people who are frontline to start to pay attention to numbers and start to pay attention to tracking metrics in order to find things like um, problems with quality or problems with uh, injury or other, or other areas. And I do think there is room for some of that. Um, but again, it has to be done in a way that is respectful and shows appreciation. So I do think that there is room at a certain level um, that is job specific for all of us to, to kind of understand what the priorities are and how the data support that. Um, so I, hopefully that answered your question. Um, uh -huh. We do have do another see, question. Yeah, the question yeah. on the, um, my bias, the question is, uh, do you think uh, existing traditional business people or existing um, analysts, and I don't know if that's exactly the question that Pam's asking, but I tend to believe that people who have some analytical and uh, data literacy already uh, seem to bridge over to translating a little bit easier than folks who have absolutely no data awareness at all. But the other characteristic is you have to really want to learn how to communicate differently. So there's sort of a sort of a triple, it's a a triple set of capabilities. You uh, should be able to be comfortable with the data side. You should be comfortable with the business side and you should be interested in getting better and better at conversations, questions, and knowing how to translate and visualize. All right, any other questions? Okay. Well. Thank you very and, much, Wendy, yeah, for if the anyone, great presentation. Sure. If anyone is interested, we probably will offer not only the online training, but also an interactive um, training with coaching 
because a lot of times it helps to practice the, the um, communication side. So anybody who's interested in that, feel free to reach out to me um, directly. I will put my email in the chat or you can get me on, uh, on LinkedIn as well. Um, so to everyone, I will do it. So feel free to reach out. I, my goal is to train a thousand analytic translators. <laughs> it still won't uh, be enough, uh, but that's my uh, goal. You, you, you're well on the way. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. And Mark, well, thank you so much for, um, for being our host today. Thank you again, Wendy. And, and just to remind everybody, we will be posting the recorded webinar and slides to dataversity.net within a couple of business days. And we'll send a follow up email to let you know the links and other requested information during today's webinar. So thank you again, everybody. Thank you, chat, for being so electric today. And I hope everybody has a wonderful day. Great. Thanks, everyone.